Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? Good. I'm feeling great. Yeah. Yeah. It's Friday on the 20th, November 2020. 2020 11 those sound like lucky numbers they do yeah wow 20 on 11 11 mm -hmm. i guess if we if we had started this talk right at 11 11 uh then uh we'd be like extra in the lucky zone yeah, yeah. a little late or early but... well you have a you have a show up right now yeah over in downtown and uh it's the biggest show i've done yet and uh I feel yeah, good about it. It's pretty substantial. Um, Thank you. It was uh, great to be able to come by the other night and uh, be able to go through the space and see all the work. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you for inviting me uh, to come. Oh, thank and, you for coming through and yeah, spending chat time with it. I love what you have to say about it and such a good insight always, Patrick. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, it's hard to have insights unless there's something to talk about. And so you brought that forward, uh, really tremendous work. Um, not only like working at a scale that is kind of like kind of working at this kind of other level, but also through some of the series in, a, in the works um, in the show that uh, you're kind of really like focusing in um, uh, on some ideas that I, I really saw start to kind of like, like really blooming in this show. Um, and, that's what I'm really excited to talk about today. Um, is there like a particular work that you want to kind of jump in with, like kind of get our toe wet? To get the feet wet? Um, yeah. yeah, we could talk about a little cowboy since it's at the entrance and it's probably the first painting that people recognize. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a painting from Stranger Things originally. It's a scene from season two, episode two. It's the Halloween episode. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I was explaining how it was the scene where the cop was sneaking through the pumpkin patch with all the rotten pumpkins looking for the alien. And it's the sci fi show. So you're expecting like a goblin to jump out, but you find this, uh, you hear a click and you see this little boy with a gun pointing at the cop and he's just so bold saying, I got you and uh, shooting up in the air. And uh, I felt like I found that was the most fantastical moment of the episode, even though there was no alien because in real life he would have been shot, um, the guy's head blown off. And I thought it was significant that it was a little black boy and that they were saying something a little bit more than what was there. And I wanted to capture that moment and put it on whatever pedestal oil painting can give. If you render it and freeze that moment of him shooting his gun in the air triumphantly. And um, for some reason I identify with that boy and uh, yeah, just the innocence there. Um, mm. Yeah. Also, there's something about that, uh, the way that you, I mean, that was a moment and you described it as the most fantastical moment of the whole episode. All right. And also it's one that, um, you know, probably could have just kind of viewers watch it and they might kind of make a very subconscious observation there that like, huh, this is, this is different than how things would go in normal life or, mm -hmm. oh, we're in a world where, you know, police don't just kind of haul off and, and, um, shoot like young black boys that uh have you know a toy gun in hand you know even when it's halloween and such and so but through kind of like going back to that moment and expanding it there's also this kind of relationship to time that opens up there in terms of like how do we hold space um you know in the in society there's all of these kinds of opportunities to see like uh and comment on like systemic racism, systemic problems, like representation and kind of the way that these roles play out in fictions mm -hmm. as well as reality. And so there's something really interesting there about how you decided to kind of uh, freeze time in a moment that might not have been seen as one of the most significant things that happened that season, you know, right. um, in terms of the plot development and the characters. It's, it's not certainly uh, something that like, um, you know, made it as far into the popular consciousness as like the characters and what happens in the final episode and things like that. But 
So I'm really interested in like how you, um, you know, kind of like what for you is like happening in that moment where you're like freeze framing or drawing attention to something that would otherwise go kind of like unnoticed. I think I do have to give credit partially to the, like, you know, the actual show with the dark background and um, maybe they were trying to put it on a pedestal, but uh, even with the meme culture today, how people choose to take pieces of the world and put their own comments to it or mm -hmm. turn them into gifts and uh, the world's constantly getting like cut out and like, this was the funny part, this is this or that. Um, I don't know, it's not funny. So it wasn't really appropriate to just make it a meme in re on repeat. Um, and just to attach myself to it in a, on a deeper level by changing its, uh, its format into this handmade object in a larger format than originally seen. Um, also, that was interesting, you can't just screen capture on Netflix you have to like pause it and like take a, I took paused it and took a picture with my cell phone with it and you you're automatically going to get a lower quality but um yeah when you freeze it you just get to uh unpack it for a little bit longer just that yeah. half a second or that full moment um yeah yeah, there's something really interesting too. Now that we're talking about it, when you had mentioned like the dark background, it didn't click in my head the first time I saw the painting. But um, as we had walked through the show, you talked about kind of classical painting and figuration at different points. But like particularly in this one, that dark background just kind of like all of a sudden like Caravaggio like went off in right. my head and kind of like, you know, that signature dark background where there's like figures in the in the forefront that are you know being kind of almost like theatrically like highlighted and um it's just really interesting because like uh Caravaggio never painted a, a black body the mythologies that were available to Caravaggio at that time were very rooted in like a white sense of Christianity mm -hmm. and so it's just really interesting to think about like where where we've gotten uh in terms of like now you're pulling images, these like split second moments off of Netflix and being able to kind of like show an important moment that it's not part of this kind of like um, these mythologies that have shaped the world, like, you know, Christianity and, and, you know, and to a lot of degrees, white supremacy and colonialism and these things. But they're kind of like this moment where you find a character you identify with and you get to mythologize that moment, even if it's just a snippet from like a piece of popular media. Yeah. And uh, getting to mythologize it in a, I guess, a, the Christian white way in the past, uh, kind of just stealing that format, stealing that way of, uh, of significance of what you would see at the Getty or something like that. Um, but, you know, just to prove, or maybe not to prove, but, you know, like, he deserves this too. I'm able to produce it. Then why not take that privilege? And um, it, I'm just like, I'm sorry that it perpetuates that, like, oh, yeah, this is important because this and that, or this is important because... Um, it's a reference to Caravaggio, but uh, it's already happened and everything that I'm doing is a reaction anyway. Um, yeah. It's not like I could change the past or I could change, but I'm playing off of what everybody else already knows. Um, so uh, it's just yeah, to, it's like to, for them to react quicker and get that idea a little bit faster. Yeah, definitely. By just kind of changing the characters that are in the mythology, then, and the way that mythology has been presented, it's like, we already know how it's been presented. We're somewhat familiar with it, having kind of studied art or being somewhat familiar with art and Caravaggio and whatnot. So then just by kind of what I'm gathering from what you're saying, it's like, just by kind of putting a different representation in there, you know, coming from a totally different kind of like, you know, contemporary streaming platform media, but also a different body, a different subject in there. 
yeah. that it lets us kind of like read it in terms of multiple histories and also like popular presence like all at once which is yeah. something I want to kind of use to like because there's a lot of themes in this one painting that also I think are like really great for talking about the the behind third base paintings yeah um, in terms of like time and also mythology and like uh, those paintings that are like really exploding uh, with like color and lots of characters and bodies and figures. As opposed to the singular character, yeah. Um, it's more of multiple people's reaction to one thing uh, versus uh, like one person's reaction. But yeah, the whole picture of uh, this baseball bat flying into the crowd and everybody's reaction <laughs> and you get this fight or flight. Um, I also think of Judgment Day and also Judgment Day painting. So also referencing, um, you know, Sistine Chapel and, you know, people just cowering and uh, other animals and like demon-like figures and people wearing uh, masks. It was like a, 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 t a touch theme that mm -hmm. goes along there and, um, uh, Sometimes I think of them as like what they turn into when you get put into that situation, like what demons could come out or, um, but yeah, with the first behind third base, it's the man catching the bat. And yeah. I, I switched up a lot of the characters. Like I took this shirt off and um, I turned one lady into a cat and you know, put some monsters in there and I put some like tropical things around it. I just like to experiment to uh, uh, like see what I could change and see how the narrative changes when I do those types of things. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of play, like yeah. a tremendous amount of play in that work. Cause like, from what I understand, these are like actual snapshots that you used as reference of right. a moment where a batter uh, in like a baseball game's bat flies out of their hand and it goes like kind of flying into the audience uh, that's just kind of uh, just to the left of like where third base is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not what they expect. And uh, if you're a left-handed batter, it would be going toward first base. So I'm not really considering them, but my bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, you let go of the bat and uh, there's a lot of people reaching for it for the memorabilia also it's like but a lot of people are afraid of it it's just this oblong object coming toward you yeah that yeah, doesn't wow. fly as even as a ball right right it's just yeah. not what you expect at all that's not what you go for the game to the game for and um but it's weird how many analogies baseball has to life mm -hmm. um, and yeah like so like uh, on a whole nother level like sometimes life throws a bat at you and what are you gonna do with it you're gonna catch it and get it signed hopefully and i think that's like uh stepping up to the plate yeah and that <laughs> um that just kind of you know these kind of little kind of almost like aphoristic or almost like allegorical mm -hmm. kind of like uh plays on words both in some of the titles as well as just in the imagery and what they stand for is something that like runs through a lot of these kind of larger works but um something about what you said there in terms of like um the way like how are you going to respond reminded me of something we were talking about before which was just that like you saw a meme where in which like one of these snapshots was there and then because there was a bunch of different people responding someone put all of the different astrological oh, right yeah kind of labeling them yeah which is kind of something that triggered off in my mind when we were talking about like mythologies or in that particular instance like astrology is a cosmology but like this moment of chaos where a bat just flies into the audience and then meme culture and this culture of being able to freeze images and then mm -hmm. kind of tell our own stories with like them. Creating raw forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 and like kind of superimposing mythologies or cosmologies on the other things. So I'm, I'm interested to, um, to explore that more as we talk, but also like the masks um, and the kind of more like these metaphysical figures that are appearing in there. Um, 
it really creates like this atmosphere where like fantasy and reality are really like blending and blurring and like mm -hmm. which mythologies are entering and which kinds of like you know like figures are appearing uh, it gets really kind of like really playful and i'm interested to hear like kind of just some of your thoughts about like fantasy and, yeah like, i'm like i'm into i feel like with fantasy you get sorry you get symbolism and like let's say they're wearing masks with that information you you can't really figure out exactly how the thing works because it's not completely thought through it's um something created by a human but um yeah with the it's like you're you have less information so you have to fill in the the gap um mm -hmm. and with the mythological creatures or the fantastical creatures in the crowd uh, i just want the actual crowd the viewer to fill in that that gap of um like it's weird like everybody's wearing masks nowadays you know uh covid yeah but i feel like people are more recognizable or relatable in a way like uh, the mm -hmm. people i'm working with he look like with the mask on he looks like zach galifianakis <laughs> but without a mask he looks like himself or um this other guy looks like a friend of mine with the mask on but without it it looks like himself but I could relate to them or I could feel, I fill in the gap in my mind only because the lack of the information. Um, and maybe just making me more comfortable, you know, uh, or, you know, and I feel like that's what art should do. You should have like a space to walk in and walk around in it. There shouldn't be like an answer like, oh yeah, these are clearly people from something um from that moment it's very clear um but yeah. yeah i think that's one thing that i really appreciated about quite a few of the works in this show is that like the way that you kind of get into a moment you you start from a starting point that's like of the world where you're there's an interest and an investigation there but then like with the third base series it's like you know i'm kind of cataloging this kind of um this moment in the world that I think is interesting but then you see like the potential in that to become a setting like almost like mm -hmm. uh, a choreography for another type of image and see like kind of where and how you can lay layer in all these different kind of approaches mm -hmm. um, to storytelling in a way but when they all coexist in one image they kind of confuse one another which with the masks I mean that just reminds me of like the whole purpose of a masquerade or a carnival is that you lose your identity in the mass of the fantasy of the moment. Mm -hmm. And then you, that enables you to kind of like um, destabilize your own identity so that you can play out like fantasies or actions or, or things yeah. that you normally couldn't. And then um, for the greater crowd society. Yeah. Yeah. What do you say about society? I was just saying like in a normal, like orderly society, oh, right. it's not a carnival where you're allowed to wear masks and, it's kind of interesting to think about like, I mean, right now you, you brought up COVID and the masks that we wear. Um, and I've been noticing a lot of people like, you know, with like anime character masks on, like somebody had like a Tokyo Ghoul mask and like yeah, wow. somebody else had like a Sailor Moon mask or somebody had one that like looked like they had like a ball gag in their mouth. And like, yeah. there's this new level of kind of like fantasy on the face um, yeah. that's like possible. We're all just playing with it. Especially yeah. in America, I don't, I don't know if it's just us. Probably not, but because we are, we've been seeing masks more from afar. But mm -hmm. once it's our turn, we're just like making our own and selling all these custom ones and just trying yeah. to make it, make it hot as possible. We're really into our individuality, or I guess I am. I don't know. I, I'm participating in like cool, funky mask, um, but. I don't know. I try to. I just have a couple of them that have cool patterns on them, and I think that reflects the inside. Um, and back to like the during a carnival or a masquerade party um, with everybody wearing a mask that just attributes to the um, 
the total fantasy is like you're not only uh relieving your own identity but you're relieving the identity of the all of society so um or like so everybody could have more fun everything's more festive when everybody's wearing a mask uh so with everybody wearing a mask now like everything's changed it's just like a signifier and some people don't want things to change and like try to be a party pooper even though it's not a party people are dying but yeah um yeah yeah like the 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 setting uh for this it's it's hard to blend it fully together right because of the point you just made that there's like this kind of very serious and macabre Mm -hmm. reality to not wearing the mask in this particular instance um but but obviously the the masks and the the ways in which this kind of uh more like mask of play as opposed to like mask of sanitation or mask of safety that shows up in your work um it really reminds me of uh also i had mentioned before that like um james enzer uh painting where there's all these figures that are kind of in a lot of his paintings like where like because of the way that like color is used on the faces and then sometimes because like actually the figures are wearing masks in the paintings then there creates this confusion where there's like in a way like a mask is like an abstraction of the face right Mm -hmm. and it's a narrative abstraction because it's usually like a character or it's coming from something um it's coming from another story like it might be a goblin it's coming from another kind of plane of reality or something like that but um uh that that there's this confusion between what is the real face like who in the crowd is wearing a mask and who isn't because of the way that the rendering kind of lets that float in a letter in a bit of ambiguity and yeah it gets me to this point about like ambiguity a little bit um because that you know you were talking about as an artist you want people to be able to like come in and like walk around yeah um um with that ambiguity ambiguity and yeah with the painting you're referencing it makes me think of like you know paintings are the artist's own world and uh yeah drawing that line is impossible unless he's actually like telling you like he this is a mask and this isn't um so thinking of um i have the painting of mask and masculinity where the it's actually a person wearing a mask but it's all monochrome and very um it has that flatness to it yeah um but and it's also you can't really tell like where the mask starts and ends and there's bodies coming out of the face and it's almost a mars eating his children vibe and uh there's like tears there and um but yeah mask referencing the outside world or outside stories but it also could reflect the inside um Mm kind of like what i was talking about with like my own pattern mask and it's the kente cloth um you know just referencing like a lineage and the proud african history and you could wear that pride on your face but um it also and it, it covers me sanitizes me but you know people mask themselves with emotions or um stereotypes that they think that they have to flow with and Mm. just to like survive society or feel more comfortable with society um you know having excuses and and things like that it is just like covering things up and yeah we're I'm, i'm working working in layers often yeah. so uh, yeah i try to reveal i like revealing the process too like when i'm making the work so that's why you'll see a lot of just like some things are a little bit sketchier than than others but uh, i don't see the it doesn't devalue the painting as i go i just i want to leave it there for um just the exposure exposing people to like every piece of it every piece of you every every layer um it makes the image not like uh the legibility of the image isn't resolved or like because you pulled something from netflix and that's kind of in montage i might use like uh like a film term like the diegetic which is like the, the film world and like 
you know, we suspend a certain level of disbelief in order to buy into the reality of the film, you know, right. or like how you describe like the artist world is, is kind of created within the painting. And so we're often kind of, I think as observers, we're trying to look for like, what are the limits of this kind of like view? Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, um, and then what are the anomalies, you know, and like, what are the things that kind of don't seem to make sense? And then like, there's this kind of friction that happens in between those things where like really, that's where ambiguity lies, right? Where we are wow. indeterminacy, where we can like create meaning. And there's this moment in one of your paintings that I found was really interesting. Um, it was in the, um, the Solid Illusion painting um, where there's this, it's funny to start with this section of the painting because it's like the least notable part of it, but there's like these two little dogs in well, the bottom. favorite parts of it, yeah. Yeah, like obviously the painting is is amazing. Like it's it's an extreme, a, a giant diptych with larger than life characters, like a, an amazingly rendered uh, Siberian tiger of this kind of magic show that's happening. And we get to be kind of almost backstage looking out at the audience, seeing this happen from behind. There's so much to talk about with it, but also the reason the portal that I took into this painting was these kind of really kind of like uh, sketchy, almost like illustrated kind of dogs that could go completely unnoticed in the bottom left-hand corner of the painting. Yeah. That the tiger, which is like so detailed and kind of like, you know, very beautiful in the way that you rendered it is kind of just like, giving it like a little like nod off to the bottom left of the painting to kind of like look at them, uh, addressing yeah. them, even though we wouldn't, that's not where our eye jumps first, you yeah. know? Yeah, um, try to, he has the line to get to the, the dogs. He, that's like the only line that gives you a path to the dogs. And um, yeah, I didn't hit them a ton of times. And uh, I think in that painting, I kind of used the, the yellow color as like a as the darkness or um, mm. also kind of let it sit when it felt good and cute enough i wanted those dogs to stay as cute as they were uh, i could have like rendered it and over rendered it but i didn't want it to pop out and um, looking at rembrandt's night watch painting there are these there's one dog, I'm pretty sure it's just one dog, but it looks like he just kind of just did a little sketchy painting and then he got a little bit of like chalk or something or a white pastel or something. I'm only, I haven't seen it in person, but he just like outlined it and just looks, and he's like in the front, a little bit over to the right. And, uh, and I know it's a large painting. I'm like, oh, this is a large painting too. I want to, like I want to keep these dogs and I feel like Rembrandt's spirit was like it's okay to just like leave it the way it is you know mm. um if you like it you should leave it and yeah um and they just represent they're like a symbol of like the innocent prey of like they're they're the sleepy dogs like we were talking about from oh yeah high Asian. Um, and yeah it was cool to throw in so many different references in that big painting and uh, just trying to figure out what it mean what it meant uh as i was making it you know during covid you know it was, like, yeah. it well, was I'd love for liberating. You to, we took this kind of little back door into that painting i'd love for you to talk because there's so much kind of going on in it um the one thing that i would be interested in talking more about is kind of like the the narrative of the painting is these stage magicians who are doing a trick where in which they're cutting a tiger and or they're making it appear they're doing an illusion mm -hmm. as though they're like cutting this tiger in half with a with a clear plate of glass yeah uh, where the tiger is being separated happens along the actual lines where the two canvases are separated right and that play between the physicality of like the edges of the paintings and the illusion of the painting being a space that we're looking mm -hmm. into so there's so much going on it. I just want to like pitch that out there and yeah. I just want to hear more of your, of your thoughts about so that. Physically, it's a solid illusion since it's two paintings. That could be one painting because I painted them together, together and separately. Mm -hmm. um, 
but yeah and also like whatever symbolism you want to throw on top of it uh when you're looking at or like if you want to throw politics on top of it the solid illusion of um you know the separation of uh evil power trying to prey on the innocent um but yeah i was also like thinking it through um like me having the control of putting together and separating this tiger mm. uh, so there are these like lion tamers there or the not lion tamers tiger tamers yeah there um so, and they're larger than realistic they're these giants so that you should have like this uh feeling of safety um mm. but there's also like scratches they're very fantastical characters they're not real um and to me i um i relate them to like celebrity or some type of um like alter ego or like a what would you call that like a higher self or something or a higher idea of like what people can be or a symbol of people of power or something or good people of power though the ones that are um controlling it I don't know. like true leaders like people who true actually true. lead by thinking about the well-being of all the people that they're entrusted to guide yeah 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 but it's also like it could be overthinking and thinking, i don't know but um yeah well it's interesting because i actually love stage magic and using it as a metaphor to think about what we do as artists mm -hmm. uh, you know when you think about like um the stage magicians they practice their the, their capacity to create an illusion behind the scenes so that when it happens it feels seamless and effortless but there's like this tremendous amount of practice and development of, of technique and kind of choreography and precision that is required in order to make it look so easy that it's mm -hmm. like nonchalant, you know, and smooth. Right. Um, and I'm curious to think, uh, just we could use that to, to jump into like thinking about like practice or um, even like the studies or like reference yeah. materials, things like that. When you're in the studio, when particularly you're making that painting, like, is that idea like you're just thinking of that idea and then you're just going straight to canvas or are you doing like sketches and plans and or, or do you have like a collection of those things you're drawing from? I see yeah. stuff in the background of your studio right now. Uh, so. I'm constantly, uh, not constantly, but I'm drawing, do little drawings. It always starts small. Do, um, like things like this is from the uh, oh, present yeah. painting. Uh, but yeah, starting out small, it started out as a uh, drawing from a little bit ago, and, and when I drew it, I'm like, man, this deserves to be on a, a huge canvas, and I'm sure it was back in, like, 2015 or something, and uh, yeah. so wow. thinking about it for a while, and of them pointing and things, I didn't have the, the background fully figured out yet, or, like, what I want around it, but um, as I had been making those other paintings and I was telling you about like this formula that I was having of including the real and real people made with made up people and mixed with uh, nature and with those three things together uh, just it creates this scene and of uh, cool fantasy that's a little bit more believable because all three of those things are in there and it's a uh, another step to get whatever is in my head into your head or um you know it has a uh, entry points with the realism mixed with my own uh, drawings being rendered into that world um and uh, that's part of what's important to me in a painting and uh, success as a, when I make a piece of art. Um, and uh, yeah, were you asking again? Oh, I was just, I was just wanting to understand more about your process because- Oh, we, your process, yeah. I, I was just kind of, I was just riffing, like we went from stage magic and kind of all of the behind the scenes yeah. process. That and it's weird because I, I do like to reveal the behind the scenes yeah um because i do start with the yellow but i just love it so much i want it 
you could call it an underpainting, but I could leave a painting like that, obviously, like I shown in the show. And um, I just want the audience to fall in love with that that palette as much as I have. Um, the yeah. Glowing. Um, but when I do paint on top of it, it's uh, adding more language to it and it it's uh it's it's kind of hiding like what was originally there um, because originally it was all just black and yellow and not even any white and that could have been left that way mm. but um yeah just like the more colors i add i feel like the more symbols are there and the more noise is there even so um yeah so I like to reveal the process, even with the dogs. The dogs are like seeing behind the scenes of the whole thing, and um, uh, it's expressing vulnerability too, and it um, them being a symbol of innocence to me, and being painted in a very vulnerable way means a lot to like just leave it alone. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting thinking about what they represent because there's I I'm thinking about it from these different angles where like the tiger is the one that's seeing them, but the tiger is an animal, right? right? It's like rendered more naturalistically, but then like these kind of cartoon images of animals, which honestly I'd say like more people have a relationship to cartoon animals than they do to like real animals in nature at this point. Yeah like kind of more city oriented contemporary society like in los angeles for instance mm -hmm. um and um especially dogs yeah yeah or like you know that there's there's this kind of domestication right like almost like a cartoon image of an animal is like a domesticated you know version or like kind of distillation caricature of the essence of that animal or something yeah. so it seems i don't even know if i have enough brain power to like disentangle what all is going on there with the tiger looking at those and being like the one that's revealing them to us yeah. but there's something happening there. there's a relationship between the animals uh the cartoon dogs being on a flat surface is more digestible maybe than the tiger being there and more believable uh one the tigers cut in half and two uh it's weird because like um do how much do i want the audience to believe there is a innocent dog there versus there's an innocent tiger there too that's what tiger king was all about like the like you can't be treating animals this way and like siegfried and roy and like all this stuff happened you know right um that's what you were wrestling so i don't know why i'm talking about that but no no you know, i mean it's, it's part like, of the 2020 consciousness yeah, you know it's like oh yeah you can't you can't treat any animal this way, but I wanted to make like a separation of this guy and that guy, like, um, but yeah. Well, it's interesting too, because like, and I didn't pick up on this before, um, but so like in like these tiger shows and like magic, you know, like the Siegfried and Roy, the Tiger King, that kind of thing, like this big cat trainer performance where then these cats are being used in performance um that uh it's almost like there's something happening there where like you go to a ball game and there's these mascots they're like material fabrications of like graphically designed like kind yeah. of distillations and caricatures often of animals and sometimes in like very problematic ways of like indigenous people or uh, other, you know, like othered things. And nature is a very othered concept and all of the animals within that, they're not seen as like equals in our world, right? But right. that's a whole other side. But in your painting, Love Caught Time, it has in parentheses mascots, which I didn't know when I first saw it. So this weird relationship also where like, like deities, like sometimes like Zeus or Poseidon or right. like, you know will be a mascot and the mascot is such a weird like space where embodied fantasy and material fantasy like make their way into mass spectacle and also though tigers when there's an actually not like an actual animal 
that is like used in the way that a mascot is used and like paraded around like it's like a commodity in some ways it like draws into you know all these like kind of ethical questions about spectacle and fantasy and like what what is it that's being kind of like um you know held up in that like it's entertaining but to what end like what's the yeah. product of that you know like who is like um there's a detriment also yeah. there and so, i like to imagine the tiger is frustrated and you could imagine like why is he frustrated and ferocious like maybe yeah in the wild it'll be like that or that he would want to run away if he was free but is it because he is a slave to these people or he's a he's a tame tiger and um now he's angry like i don't know but yeah with the mascots painting is yeah crazy to have these symbols uh, anthropomorphized and represent these larger ideas and they're here to like rally the crowd so um yeah with the crowd reaching up and they it's love catching time and maybe it's about the um like how this idea of love is promoted to being such a, a hot commodity or like everybody wants a certain type of love and like what this um i don't know what they're um, holding each other and coming down from the sky or something out of these lemon trees uh yeah it's it's out there just for like the audience to translate really and um to me i'm i'm there just uh thinking about like why do i feel this way about like love and time and their relationship um what i was doing in grad school was just drawing these bodies together and then naming them different ideas and mm -hmm. uh, like after the fact and just seeing how by naming them different things uh what was this explaining what um what allegory is coming out of this just uh right man yeah. that's even with the tagging the the different what would you, what'd you call it the like virgo and um different oh, astrological like signs yeah 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 that's um yeah just seeing like what happens after the fact like the picture was already taken but then when you tag everything like why does it make sense all of a sudden you know it's like oh yeah a virgo would totally react that way and like yeah, yeah it's interesting because when you cast it's like love and time are concepts that they kind of there's versions of them in like pretty much every culture that i know of you know um and um even if they're radically different though. And that's the thing is that like different versions of time and the way that different cultures interpret it mm -hmm. are going to be embodied by a different type of character potentially. And are often like in mythologies embodied by different characters. Like we have like old man time in like one version or like, yeah. you know, in um, like, you know, Nordic tradition, there's like the, the kind of um, the weaver who's like spinning uh, the, you know, they're, three kind of like fiber artists essentially spinning like the threads of fate or whatever right. and essentially is fate is like time unfolding and playing out you know and but it's kind of interesting the way you were talking about it because it's like um you're creating a choreography it's like a narrative moment and by positioning like love and time in this way like it makes us realize like love and time don't behave the same in every situation right mm -hmm. like sometimes time expands sometimes it contracts like in your painting sometimes you take one moment and you turn it into a whole story or there's times where in which like a whole story has to be like distilled down into like an extremely poignant moment yeah so you couldn't even fit all of what you're trying to say into a single painting but you're mm -hmm. trying anyways and and then love obviously it's like everyone i think throughout our lives we define love differently based on like what works and doesn't work and so but by one of them holding the other and i'm interested in that pose like where is that pose coming from where is there like any other kind of like source or like historical right. yeah it was very like a pieta reference uh 
of like Mary holding Jesus and I know how Mary looked very uh, masculine in that um, sculpture and I try to like mimic the the broad shoulder and the large hands uh, holding the time figure um, but yeah and just also just referencing my other paintings with love and time in it uh, and those are like such big ideas and I talk about like the night and the sun um, and they're super hard, huge ideas to capture, but I keep reliving that same moment in different paintings uh, because it's that capture of uh, uh, time is just the love at night. And I'm trying to figure out like, why is that so important? Or like how many different ways it could, it could be done um mm. you know you know how you see the mythological paintings i don't know which one to reference but um but you see it over and over again yeah like the same stories like even like just for caravaggio like the, the uh, Ju uh, judith b heading hall of Fernies, like there's more than one rendition of that or even like um what's the one it's like saturn eating his son or something yeah. like, but you see these referenced over and over and over again yeah. and I even see like, you know, on Instagram, like people taking these old mythologies and then like casting like new figures, sometimes even political figures into the places of those kind of different characters right. as a way of kind of like of repeating or calling back to it, but also kind of amending it to meet the needs of our current moment in, mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. So, but it's me just creating that. Yeah. Out of kind of nowhere and uh hoping to find a new answer every time i do it and uh yeah try to figure out something within myself that can be shared and could last for uh generations to come yeah um but yeah like once it goes down on the canvas it kind of just i had planned for it to last you know and speaking about yourself, uh, there's a self-portrait in the show, right. which is kind of like a interesting moment um, because I don't know, I think that um, like going to see the work, I just felt like there's a tremendous amount of like earnestness in your work where it's like, you know, it's like fantastic and there's like bold colors being used and very different palettes and all these kind of different references from like mythology to pop culture to like painting and the history of art but then there's also like something very personal that it seems like it feels like you're exploring in each of the paintings like that there's this kind of like uh like inner drama that's playing out through all these characters and the blending of all these things and uh in that moment where there's like a self-portrait it kind of like just kind of like kind of galvanizes all of that that like the work feels like very personal and it is very much about like some kind of interior exploration which yeah. you know in different discourses has kind of been you know like uh, critiqued in ways but there's something um very sincere and earnest about it that actually kind of like uh caught me off guard in a good way um like, why does this belong here um yeah it's the I always say like, oh yeah, there's only one real person in there, but I forget that I have my own self-portraits in there and it, uh, yeah, self-portraits are important to me. I feel like capturing myself at that moment or the age and in this one in particular, there's me in several different um, times and um, I've been painted out myself in one of them and yeah, it's a... Uh, it's like I really do it. I'm staring at myself, and it's supposed to be a secure moment, but there are like insecurities in me. When I show other people, they uh, they could kind of tell and like single things out, or they'll say um, might say things that I don't like about myself or whatever. But mm. it, at least they get to share with me like this uh, this mirror moment and. I was also thinking about selfies and how uh, people became so comfortable with taking pictures of themselves and putting it out there. And there's not to like judge or anything, but um, 
I I was like wondering why I wouldn't take selfies anymore. And I'm like, well, I'm a painter and this is the medium that I want to uh, be represented by. And to have control over that is a thing, but I feel like the whole painting is a very contained painting. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not like super loose in it, let's say, or they're not candid moments, you could say, you know, I'm very, yeah, definitely. It's also interesting because, uh, in terms of self portraiture and selfie culture, like Mm -hmm. it's almost like with the rise of selfie culture, I've seen less and less self portraiture in like painting, like Mm -hmm. overt self portraiture, like, you know, self prescribed, like this is a self portrait. Yeah. You know, so, some people say, you know, that like all artwork is to some degree a portrait of an aspect of the artist's mind and the way that their mind works. And thus it's kind of putting on view their kind of view of reality. And that Mm -hmm. is like a kind of latent or kind of veiled portrait of who they are. But but to have something, I think that's why that self-portrait kind of caught me is it like immediately made me think about like, man, like, I probably have taken more pictures of myself since the beginning of like social media than I ever even cared about. Like I didn't even care whether or not there were pictures of me in the world, like proving my existence or whatnot. Mm -hmm. I was just kind of in life and we live, I think you and I uh, like are in a generation where in which we had a moment prior to social media and then like transitioned into that moment. So there's this kind of like, have a you know, what yeah. yeah um yeah so we're transitioning and i feel like after i die my whole life is going to be on facebook and instagram i had this idea where um if when i die i'll take down the facebook and make it into an actual book and just like take it out of that world and uh, make it physical um, yeah. as I take my physical self out of this world and turn into a ethereal thing but um, yeah one of those ethereal spirits that's like flowing through the crowd in your paintings yeah just like <laughs> wow no but um, yeah and just like just the control of representation of, of myself and like why is that important to me like right now and um yeah it's also like yeah people recording or taking pictures of me without permission or something like that and it's not posed and um why am i worried about like uh coming off wrong or something and like i don't know maybe even as an artist I guess that'll be being self-conscious, but um, at the same time, I'm trying to, uh, I've been spending time creating a, a career or like or an image and right. I don't know. And as an image maker as in a career, you kind of overthink those types of things, you know? You know sure. Like, I mean, like that's a theory. complicated relationship, you know? Um, it's interesting, man, Elijah, I love, I love chatting with you about your work and whatnot. Um, you know, for, uh, just for the sake of time, I know that we're supposed right. to, I'm saying, around, right. you know, 45 to an hour or whatever, but I wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything else about the show, like before we kind of culminated that you, you know, just like if there's something we didn't touch on that you wanted to talk about or like themes or approaches or, the different rooms or anything, you know, um, the inclusion of particular works or whatnot. Like if there's anything you want to kind of hold a little bit of space for before we. Um, Yeah. All I really could think about is like in this show, it could be, it seems like it could be like uncontained, but I think that's also a part of the theme of how I've been approaching work. And if I were to imagine my process, it's like I'll be walking on the on the ground on a surface and I'll be uh, seemingly a more solid painting, but uh, I quickly like to detach from what is traditional or um, 
it's like you're no longer in this world you're outside of it but then i do like to return to uh nature and something natural or more digestible and so you'll see completely fantastical characters that don't even look like they're a part of earth and then uh you'll see something very real and uh, more grounded and and even with the styles you'll see something very tight and you'll see something very loose and um something with a lot of layers and you'll see the abstract and you'll see so there's jumps but uh, I don't know. That's how I like to do. I'm I'm an airy person, you know. You're you're here. You go up, and you're you're back there, and you're underwater. And so yeah, it's a big show, and you you're traveling. You're not um, you're escaping a little bit. So it's very 2020 to me too. I feel like there's something crazy happening every week, and uh, I've been yeah. making these paintings so. Uh, just to relate to the times, yeah. Boo. Yeah, and Boo and Villa is the this is the reference of the whoever's like watching and wondering. So referencing the flowers in the on the piece of the the left side with the woman and the puppies. There's the Bougainvillea flowers, um, and I just abbreviated it because we're on Flower Street and got to name it after a flower. Keep it simple, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Boo, like, we kind of talked about that, like, just right. phonetically conjures a lot of different images. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how it's spelled and whatnot is different than the way that it's said. And I found myself, again, like, my head kind of splitting off in these like, totally different directions when I just was looking at that, just as a little kind of phoneme, like a little just piece of sound, mm -hmm. and, you know, from like, being like startled by a ghost like boo to like something you call an affectionate you know like an intimate person that you're boo you know and stuff mm -hmm. like that so uh there was just in the title itself it kind of retained enough of this ambiguity even though it had a point of origin in effect yeah it holds enough of this ambiguity that it it allows our mind to kind of a lot of room to wander which yeah. i like really captured the spirit particularly of those third base paintings and and the larger like the um solid illusion painting and um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah it was good took a lot of that and like alan um the gallery director helped me think through it too we just were shooting things back and forth and i was like yeah. villa couldn't really spell it right it's just abbreviated boo like, that looks good yeah but well you know, congratulations on it's like a it's a tremendous show. Clearly, you, you put tons of time and effort. And, Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to me right now. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, of course. Friday night. Yeah. yeah, you could do your jacket looks amazing. And <laughs> yeah, I love this jacket. I mean, yeah. keep purple. It's one of my favorite colors. So I have no purple in my closet. I do have like a sailor's jacket somewhere in my parents' closet that you might look great in. <laughs> and then we could make a trade, not that jacket, but something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't um, trade away this jacket. This is no, it's not that one. Yeah, I'm taking I'm taking this one with me for life right here. Yeah, you're buried. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. Well, that's everything, though. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, man.